In this section, I'll discuss utility theory and how to incorporate it into the modern portfolio theory. Then we'll discuss the optimal portfolio. As you might expect, the ideal portfolio will lie on the efficient frontier. Then we'll use some real world data and optimize both a three asset portfolio and a four asset portfolio, each consisting of some stocks and a T-bill. Let's get going. Let's start out with a question. I have four securities here, three stocks and a T-bond. Each has a different expected return and standard deviation. The large cap stock offers the lowest stock return, but also has the lowest volatility of all the stocks. The distressed stock offers the highest return, but also has the highest volatility. And the bond offers the lowest return and no volatility. If you had to choose which one of these securities is best, which one would you choose? Well, in this case, the security you select says something about you. According to modern portfolio theory, each of these stocks are equivalent since they have the same sharp ratio. However, in the past, I've found that when I ask this question in class, a lot of my students will prefer the small cap stock or the distress stock. That desire to hold a riskier security, even though it has the same risk adjusted return or sharp ratio, is indicative of your level of risk aversion. Some investors are more risk averse while others are less risk averse. If you've not picked up on it yet, I happen to be fairly moderately risk averse. I'd probably prefer the, the small cap stock or the large cap stock. Now risk aversion is closely tied to utility functions. And as I hope you remember from your economics courses, utility is the benefit a person derives from some activity or asset. People are utility maximizers. They want to increase their utility as much as they can. As investors, we want to measure utility. We do this by using a utility function. A utility function is a formula that has utility, in this case right here, on the left hand side, and all of the components that affect a person's utility on the right hand side. The utility function you're looking at right now is one that's used on the CFA exams. It says that a person's utility is equal to the expected return on their portfolio minus one half times the coefficient of risk aversion A times the variance of their portfolio. We should be able to estimate the expected return and the variance, but A here, the coefficient of risk aversion, is a bit tricky to estimate. When we're talking about risk aversion, what we're talking about is how much someone dislikes risk. People who are extremely risk averse will have a higher coefficient of risk aversion and want to maintain a portfolio that has low volatility. People who are risk neutral or risk indifferent don't require a change in return as compensation for greater risk. Most of the investors you'll see in the real world are risk averse, meaning that they'll have a positive coefficient of risk aversion. It's rare to find someone who is completely risk neutral. However, those people would have a coefficient of risk aversion, A, equal to zero. There are also some rare cases where people can be risk seeking or risk loving. The best example I can give you is in horse racing. Some people choose to bet on the horse with the longest odds for the thrill of the potentially large payday. In that case, the risk associated with the bet offers those individuals some utility. In other words, they derive some value from the thrill of not knowing. If someone is risk seeking, their coefficient of risk aversion will be negative. Now, the problem with utility functions and risk aversion is that it's almost impossible to measure them. In the real world, personal financial planners use surveys and questionnaires to assess how risk averse an individual is. Those questionnaires might ask the investor how they feel about a variety of investments or activities. Based on those responses, we can infer a level of risk aversion. The difficulty in estimating utility and risk aversion is part of the reason why people tend to focus on the first step of the modern portfolio theory, the security selection step. We use utility theory in the second step of the process, the asset allocation step. 
Now let's see how we can use utility theory in conjunction with our efficient frontier from the last video. Alright, so here, this blue line, this is our efficient frontier, or the entire thing is often referred to as the minimum variance frontier, or the minimum, minimum variance curve. And here we have some indifference curves. These reddish or orangish or pinkish or peachish lines, these are our indifference curves. They represent points on a curve that all have the exact same utility. So this utility, uh, this indifference curve that is the, the auburn color right here, this is utility of 0 0.06. This orangish one is utility of 0 0.044, and this peachish color is 0 0.03. So every point on this peach colored line has a utility utility of 0 0.03. The reason we call these curves indifference curves is because investors are getting the same utility out of every point on this line, and so they should be indifferent to any portfolio that gives that allows them to reach any point on this line. Now notice here, I say that inc utility is increasing as we move from the bottom right to the top left, where we have high returns and low portfolio volatility. Our goal as individuals is to get as far up here in the top left-hand corner as we possibly can. Now, modern portfolio theory says that there is a point on our efficient frontier that will be tangential to some indifference curve. In other words, we want to reach the highest possible indifference curve that we can, and that indifference curve will touch our efficient frontier at exactly one point. In this case, it's right here. And this one point, this is our optimal risky portfolio. It has a portfolio of risky securities with specific weights, and this is going to give us our maximum sharp ratio. This is the portfolio or the portfolio weights that we are going to invest in. Now, in the real world, we can invest in both risk-free assets like T-bills and T-bonds as well as risky assets, and we need to take that into account in our graph. When we can invest in a risk-free asset, we can allocate capital to that asset in order to maximize our utility. The line between the risk-free asset and the portfolio with the highest Sharpe ratio is called the capital allocation line. The slope of the capital allocation line is exactly equal to the Sharpe ratio. Let's take a look. All right, so here again is our efficient frontier in blue. Over here, where we have a return or expected return of about 2% and zero volatility, this point right here represents our risk-free asset and its return. The capital allocation line starts at a risk-free rate and goes up until it becomes tangential to or runs tangential to the efficient frontier. The point at which the capital allocation line touches the efficient frontier that's our optimal risky portfolio. That's the combination of portfolio weights that we're after. Now, once we've drawn our capital allocation line, because we have a risk-free asset and another risky security that we can adjust our weights of, we can reach every point on this capital allocation line. Certainly every point between here and our optimal portfolio. So if we wanted to invest the entirety of our wealth in risky assets, we could achieve this point right here. If we wanted to be extremely risk averse and only invest in risk uh, the risk-free asset, we would be right here. But we can adjust our weights of the risk-free asset and the risky portfolio to achieve really any point here and if we can short the risk-free asset, we can achieve any point beyond the optimal risky portfolio. So just to reiterate, once we build the efficient frontier, we want to identify the point on the efficient frontier with the highest Sharpe ratio. That point is called the tangency portfolio. We can draw a line from that portfolio to the risk-free asset called the capital allocation line. 
The capital allocation line represents all portfolio combinations we can reach by altering the weights to the risky portfolio and the risk-free asset. There is only one tangency portfolio, and there's only one capital allocation line. Now, the final step in the modern portfolio theory process, once we've constructed our capital allocation line, is to determine the ideal point on that capital allocation line. That point indicates the weight of your total assets you should invest in the risky securities and the weight you should assign to the risk-free asset. To determine those weights, we use this formula right here. All I've done here is rearrange the utility function from earlier. In this formula, Y star is the weight we assign to the risky portfolio, RP or R sub P is the return on the risky portfolio, R sub F is our risk-free rate, A is our coefficient of risk aversion, and sigma squared P is our risky portfolio variance. Once we plug all of these in, we're going to know the ideal weight of our risky portfolio. And to get the weight that we assign to our risk-free asset, we're going to take 1 minus Y star. All right, now let's go through the modern portfolio theory from start to finish. Remember, in the security selection step, the first step, we identify all of the possible portfolio combinations we can have by adjusting the weights to each of our risky securities. That's how we build this, this line, this minimum variance frontier. And the top part of this from the minimum variance portfolio is called the efficient frontier. The next step is to identify our risk-free asset and then draw our capital allocation line. And that capital al allocation line will touch the efficient frontier at exactly the optimal portfolio weight, the tangency portfolio. Next, we'll, know, we'll already know our utility function. So what we're going to do is to plot our indifference curves and identify which indifference curve we can possibly reach or what the maximum utility is that we can reach. So in this case, it looks like it's the blue line, which corresponds with the indifference curve that has utility of 0 0.05. And that's right here. This point on our capital allocation line that is tangential to this blue indifference curve this represents the portfolio combination that maximizes our utility. We're investing a portion of our assets in the risk-free asset and a portion in the risky portfolio. And that risky portfolio will contain different risky assets with a specific weight assigned to each of those assets. All right, we've gone through everything. Now it's time to actually put some data to the modern portfolio theory. So what we're going to do now is a very simple three asset portfolio optimization example. And for this example, I took some real world data. We have three assets, two risky and one risk-free rate. Uh, the first risky asset we have is Berkshire Hathaway stock, AKA the BRKA shares. And the second asset we have is a gold ETF. Its ticker symbol is GLD. And then we have the one-year T-bill. We're going to use this utility function, the one I already described a little earlier. So our utility is equal to the expected return on our portfolio minus one-half the coefficient of risk aversion times the variance of our portfolio. And we're going to assume that our coefficient of risk aversion is three. Basically, we are risk averse and then we're going to identify the ideal weights to each of the stocks in our portfolio or securities in our portfolio in this case. And then we're going to identify the ideal allocation to the risky portfolio, RP, and the risk-free asset. So for this, I'm going to move over to Excel where I've already collected and cleaned the data and we're going to work through the problem. All right. We're going to be working in the three asset portfolio tab on our spreadsheet for this chapter. And here's all of the information we have. 
We know our coefficient of risk aversion. We have our T-bill rate of 1.75%, our expected return on Berkshire Hathaway's Class A shares, and the expected return on the gold ETF. And then we have the variance and standard deviations of each of our risky assets, uh, the, the two securities that are not the T-bill. The and we also have the covariance and correlation between each of these securities. Now, the other thing that we have is some starting weights, or are some starting weights. And we're going to start off with an equally weighted risky portfolio. We're going to assume that we have half of our assets in the Berkshire Hathaway shares and half of our assets in the gold ETF. And I have a cell here where I'm summing up our weights, and that'll become important later on. Basically, we always need to make sure our weights sum to 1 or 100 percent. Now what we're going to do is we're going to optimize this portfolio and identify the maximum sharp ratio. Now to do that in Excel we need to know some information. We need to know the risky portfolio mean, we need to know the risky portfolio variance and standard deviation, and then from that I'm going to calculate the sharp ratio right here. And then we'll complete the second step down here of modern portfolio theory and uh, we'll actually estimate the weight to the risky assets and the risk-free rate or the risky asset or the risk-free asset. All right, let's get started. So first step, we want to calculate the risky portfolio mean, the weighted average return on our two risky securities. So that is just the weight of asset one times the return or expected return on that asset plus the weight on risky asset 2 times the expected return on that asset. Next we need to calculate our standard deviation. Truth be told you can just you don't really need the variance here uh, but uh, I just have it there. I'll tell you what we'll just work out the risky portfolio standard deviation. Alright so this is the formula for calculating the standard deviation of a portfolio containing two securities. So let's get started. So equals square root of, actually let me move this out a bit so we can actually see it. All right, equals square root weight of security one squared times the variance of security one squared, or variance of security one, so standard deviation squared plus weight of security 2 squared times variance of security 2 plus 2 times the weight of security 1 times the weight of security 2 times the covariance between those two securities. And we'll close our parentheses. And I suppose I should move that down here because this is our standard deviation. If we wanted our variance, we would just not take the square root. So this is our formula for the variance. So it's just our standard deviation squared. All right, now we have everything that we need. We have the return on our risky portfolio, we have the T-bill rate, and we have our standard deviation of our risky portfolio. We can calculate the Sharpe ratio. So to do that, we're just going to take the risky portfolio mean minus the risk-free rate of 1.75% and divide that by the standard deviation. And that's our Sharpe ratio. Perfect. So this is our Sharpe ratio when our weights are equal. We have equal weighting here. However, let's say I wanted to adjust those. Let's say we set that at 0.25 and 0.75. As you can see, our Sharpe ratio changed. It actually fell slightly from 0.277, I believe, to 0.262. So the question is, what weights maximize this Sharpe ratio? Optimizing the Sharpe ratio is 
the culmination of the first step of modern portfolio theory. So we're going to ask Excel to optimize this sharp ratio for us. Now to do this, you're going to go up to the data tab in Excel. And over here on the right hand side, hopefully you already have these added data analysis and solver. Uh, but if you don't, you're going to need solver right now. So if you don't have solver, you're going to have to go up to file, go down to options, go over to add-ins, and go down here where it says Excel add-ins and click go. And then make sure that you have the solver add-in checked. And just go ahead and check all the others too. So when you have solver added into your copy of Excel, now you can click the solver button. And solver, what it's going to do is it's essentially going to run through as many observations or as many weights as it possibly can. It's going to adjust the weights and it's going to determine the weights that give us the highest possible sharp ratio subject to any constraints that we have placed on the computer program. All right, so there's really three pieces of information we need to put in here. First, we have an objective. Our objective is to maximize the sharp ratio. So just click the sharp ratio cell, click enter, and make sure it's set to max. Next, we need to identify some changing cells. Now the changing variable cells are the cells that are that solver is going to automatically adjust. In this case, we want to adjust our weights so that we maximize our sharp ratio. So our changing weights or our changing variable weights are just the weights of our two risky securities. Close that out. And then finally, we need to tell solver that we want to change our weights subject to some constraint because if we don't you get crazy high numbers i mean heck you can just see it here right now obviously we get some very very large numbers uh we don't want that let's try this again so we need to set some kind of constraint and before i do that i'll just reset this to 0.5 and 0.5 so I'm going to add a constraint that tells solver that this cell, the total cell, the cell where we sum up our weights, needs to always be equal to 1 or 100%. So I'm going to click OK. And we've added that constraint. And now we're ready to optimize our sharp ratio, maximize it. So I'm going to click Solve. And we found a solution. And that solution is to allocate 53.21% of our risky portfolio to Berkshire Hathaway's Class A shares and 46.79% to the gold ETF. So we're done with step one. We're done with the security selection step of modern portfolio theory. The next step, the asset allocation step, requires us to determine how much of our total wealth that we allocate to that risky portfolio. And the answer is we're just going to take our risky portfolio mean, and I'll put parentheses around it, and subtract from that the risk-free rate of 1.75%, and divide that by the quantity of our coefficient of risk aversion times our the variance of our portfolio. Now, if you remember here, I have variance of our portfolio right here. And so I'm just uh, going to close my parentheses, and there we go. Now, what this tells us, and actually I'll finish the process first. Uh, we'll take 1 minus that Y star to tell us how much we allocate to the risk-free asset. So what this thing is telling us is that in order to reach the highest possible indifference curve we can and maximize our utility, we need to allocate 35.56% of our total wealth to a portfolio of risky stocks that are held in with these weights. And the remaining 64.44% of our total wealth is going to be consisting of the risk-free asset, in this case, the T-bill. So that's that.
All right, now let's try an example that's a little more complicated. Let's optimize a four asset portfolio. And we're going to complete the same process, but as you'll see, it's a lot more complicated just because we have to take into account a lot more factors when we calculate the standard deviation of the portfolio. All right, let's get started. So here we have all the information we need. We have the coefficient of risk aversion, which again in this example is set to 3. Our expected return on our T-bill is 2%. The expected returns on each of our three risky assets are these. We have our variances for our three risky assets and our standard deviations for our three risky assets. And then we also have our correlation coefficients for each of our three risky assets. And our starting weights are just, well, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, and 0.4 across our risky portfolio. All right, so we need to calculate in our first step of the modern portfolio theory the Sharpe ratio and optimize it. And then we're going to, again, calculate the ideal weight to the risky portfolio and the risk-free asset. So same thing as before, we need to calculate the risky portfolio mean. And to do that, we're going to multiply our weights by our expected returns. And to save ourselves a little time, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll show you a new function. I, I guess I've shown it to you before, but it saves a little time. Just use the sum product function. And this function will take two different arrays or columns of data and multiply them by each other and then sum up each of the products. So we're taking the weight of stock one times the expected return of stock one plus the weight of stock two times the return of stock two plus the weight of stock three times the return of stock three. All right. And this is our risky portfolio mean right now. All right. Now let's get our risky portfolio standard deviation. Now, I'm not going to ask you to calculate this on the exam because it's really long and it's very, very easy to make a mistake, but I will just go ahead and calculate it for you uh, right now, just so you can uh, see it. So equals square root weight of stock one squared plus the variance of stock one plus the weight of stock two squared times the variance of stock two plus the weight of stock three squared times the variance of stock three plus two times weight of stock one times weight of stock two times covariance of stocks one and two plus the Actually, let's just go ahead and for, to make this a little more difficult, we'll do the standard deviations between each of these times standard deviation of stock one times standard deviation of stock two times the correlation between stocks one and two. Next, we need two times the weight of stock one times the weight of stock two times the standard deviation of stock one times the, I'm sorry, I got that wrong already. I'm already making mistakes. <laughs> All right. Uh, this time we need to take the uh, relationship between stocks. Uh, we'll do two and three. So in this case, we'll do weight of stock two times weight of stock three times standard deviation of stock one times standard deviation of stock three times the correlation between stocks two and three. All right. Finally, we take two times the weight of stock one times the weight of stock three times the standard deviation of stock one times the standard deviation of stock three times the correlation between stocks one and three. And we're done. All right, so like I said, it's fairly long, but it's done. And this is why once we go past about three assets for a portfolio, we just rely on a computer program like R or SAS or Python to do this for us.
It does it a lot faster and you can optimize portfolios that contain potentially all the stocks in the S&P 500 extremely quickly, probably in about as much time as it took us to do this. All right, next, let's get our Sharpe ratio. All right, so our Sharpe ratio is just going to be our risky portfolio mean minus our risk-free rate of 2% divided by our risky portfolio standard deviation. All right, there we go. And now we're ready to optimize. So I'm going to go up to solver and I'm going to set my objective cell to maximize our sharp ratio. And our changing cells again are our weights. These are the cells that are going to adjust as the computer optimizes our sharp ratio. And then we need to set the constraint to tell the computer that our weights always need to add to one. And so we're going to click add over here. And I'm going to specify our total cell. And we'll make that equal to one. And now we'll click solve. And solver found a solution. Perfect. So in this case, we're allocating about 78% of our total weight in our risky portfolio to asset two, about 22% of the weight of our risky portfolio to asset three, and nothing to uh, security one. All right, so that's that. Next, let's optimize our total portfolio by maximizing our utility. So again, we're going to use this formula and that just means we're taking our risky portfolio mean minus the risk-free rate up here at the, near the very top and dividing that by the quantity of our coefficient of risk aversion, three times our standard deviation squared or just our portfolio variance. So just take that squared and there we go. And one minus that is the weight that we allocate to our risk-free asset. So what this says is if we have a total worth or total wealth of a million dollars, we're putting about 200,000 of that in our risky portfolio. And the remainder of that is just going to be invested in a risk-free asset, AKA a T-bill. So that's that. All right, let's summarize what we just covered. First, we talked about utility functions and we use those utility functions to optimize the risky portfolio weights and the weight to the risk-free asset. Essentially, we use utility functions in the asset allocation step, the second step of modern portfolio theory. Second, the coefficient of risk aversion is usually measured using either surveys or direct observation, but this is the big problem that we have with the second step of modern portfolio theory. It's actually hard to estimate the coefficient of risk aversion. Next, I mentioned that the optimal risky portfolio is the portfolio that has the highest sharp ratio. So you just saw that our goal with the solver stuff was to maximize our sharp ratio. And that sharp ratio is the ratio or is the sharp ratio of the portfolio that has the ideal weights of our risky securities. Next, I mentioned that the ideal portfolio combination lies on the tangency point between uh, of the capital allocation line and the highest possible indifference curve. In other words, whatever the maximum utility is that we can reach on our capital allocation line, that's our ideal weighting between the risk-free asset and the risky portfolio. And then finally, I know you I, I hope you got a sense of this, but once we start to try and build a portfolio that contains more than three or four securities, that calculation of the standard deviation of the portfolio gets really complicated. So that's when we start to rely on programs like R to identify the ideal weights and put together the, the efficient frontier. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.